morning and welcome to worship. After a cool and rainy week we had, it's a, a little sunshine and warmth is a welcome sight and it feels good to be together here in the house of the Lord. We especially want to welcome any guests who are with us this morning. We hope you feel at home and will come again soon. Hello also to those uh, watching online. For our guests who are with us, if you feel comfortable, I would invite you to fill out a visitor's card and drop that in the offering plate by the door as you leave the, uh, after the service today. It's good to see John Hagen in his rightful place over here in the choir after celebrating his 95th birthday this week. Uh, there was a wonderful musical program here yesterday and it was recorded and is available on our YouTube page. So if you missed that, you might want to, uh, to check that out. As always, we invite our regulars to drop offerings in the plates or offering boxes uh, by the doors and other places in the church. This morning, we will be bringing the offering forward during the service and dedicating it, but no worries if you haven't given your offering yet. I assure you that if you deposit it after the service, it will be collected and appreciated just the same. This coming Saturday will be a full one at the church. We invite you to stop by for some treasures at our indoor yard sale from 7 to 11. I believe a few more volunteers still would be welcome to help set up and clean up. You can contact Cindy Harms if you would like to help with that. While you're in the neighborhood for the yard sale, you can pick up a pork barbecue dinner from 11 to 1 here in our church parking lot to benefit the Alpha and Omega Community Center. If you pre-ordered, please remember to pick up by 12.30 or we will sell your chicken to somebody else. If, if you didn't, or what's that? Pork, pork, pork barbecue. It's good to have the fact checkers behind you here. If you didn't pre-order, it would be good to come a little early while some extras are still available. Then on Saturday evening at 7, we look forward to hosting the Mennonite Children's Choir for our final Starlight Tea Concert of the season. Light refreshments follow as always. The concert also will be live streamed for those unable to attend in person. The Climbers Home Builders Group is hosting a lunch on Sunday, April 21st, following worship here in room 162 and 3. The cost for that chicken and waffles meal is $12, and you can sign up by submitting payment to Shirley Stauffer no later than next Sunday. Uh, Climbers and the Home Builders uh, is a group comprised mostly of seniors in their 70s and above, so if that sounds like you, uh, please feel free to join. Shirley hangs out in the very back bench back there. If you, if you need to know who Shirley is, she's waving back there, and she will accept your money. As noted in the bulletin, the flowers on the communion table are given by Chuck and Deb Nesland in celebration of their wedding anniversary and the blessing of family, so we thank them for the flowers and celebrate with them. A reminder that Pastor Misty is away this week, so please reach out to another pastor with any needs that may arise. It's always a good idea to use self, our, our personal cell phones rather than calling the church office because uh, some of us don't check our phones in the church office very often. In Misty's absence, we're happy to have our resident licensed minister, Matt Kramer, preaching for us this morning. Uh, looking at his sermon title, you might think he's preaching about inflation, but I heard him preach at the 8 o'clock service, and that's not it. Uh, he has a good sermon, and we'll look forward to his thoughts on the story of the demon-possessed men and the pigs. One note about the worship. Um, following the offertory prayer, there is a hymn, and it's such a, a grand and glorious Easter hymn. Even though the bulletin does not have an asterisk, I'm going to ask that you remain standing for that hymn when we sing Lift Your Glad Voices. So we'll stand for the dedication prayer, the, uh, the dedication and the offering prayer, and then remain standing for that hymn. So let us now continue in worship. Please join me in the um, responsive call to worship. 
It is found in your hymnal at 659. Grace unto you and peace from God, who was and who is and who is to come, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, ruler above all rulers of the earth. In love, Jesus Christ suffered death to free us from our sins, making all who confess Christ a nation of priests set aside for God's service. To Jesus Christ be glory and power forever and ever. I invite you to pray with me. Loving and living God, we come to you today with praise on our lips and gratitude in our hearts for the salvation that's ours in Christ Jesus. We thank you that we serve a risen Savior who loves us and cares for us and whose spirit calls us and empowers us to give our lives to him and live our lives for him and for the sake of others. We thank you, God, for the necessities of life, for homes to live in, food to eat, a a caring church family to be a part of, money to meet our own needs and to share with others so that all can have enough. As we reflect in our service today on a story of men freed from demons, we confess to you, God, that whether we understand them literally or figuratively, we all have our demons. We all have things that afflict and torment us and prevent us from being whole. And so this morning we seek deliverance from the things that hold us back. Help us to overcome bad habits that squander our time and keep our focus on the wrong things. Deliver us from regrets for our past mistakes and remind us that you forget our sins before we do. Free us from defeatist attitudes that prevent us from growing and changing and that make us unwilling to believe and accept that others can grow and change. When we face struggles, 
keep us from worry and anxiety so we can see your hand at work even in the worst of circumstances. Today, God, we pray for people we know in our church family who need a special measure of your grace. We lift up Dee and John and all of Jackson's family, Jorge and Julia and grandson Jairin, Pat's family, Mary and her family, Bev, Jim, John, Chuck, and many others on our prayer list and on our hearts who who need comfort and healing. We continue to pray for the needs of our community and world. We think of the people in Gaza, Ukraine, Haiti, and many other places where violence and war kill and destroy. We pray for people who live in countries where they can't openly worship you. We pray for people who flee violence, economic hardship, and political oppression. We pray for the leaders of our land and other lands, asking you to give them wisdom and compassion for the people they lead and serve. When we encounter trouble in this world, as Jesus said we would, O God, remind us that Jesus also said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And he can help us overcome whatever we face in this life and the next. And so God, we humbly ask you to transform illness into wholeness, war into peace, division into unity, poverty into abundance, pessimism into hope, and deep sorrow into even deeper joy. And on this Sunday when we still live in the afterglow of Easter, remind us again that Jesus has cheered the deep valley of sorrow and bade us immortal to heaven ascend so that we might lift our glad voices and triumph on high, knowing that Jesus has risen and we shall not die. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As saints of old, the first fruits brought of orchard, flock, and field to God, the giver of all good, the source of bounteous yield. So we today, first fruits would bring the wealth of this good land, of farm and market, shop and home, of mind and heart and hand. the gifts that we bring today. Continue to encourage our hearts to share what you have given us. Amen.
Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel of Mar Matthew, chapter 8, verses 28 to 34. When Jesus came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demoniacs coming out of the tombs met him. They were so fierce that no one could pass that way. Suddenly they shouted, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? Now a large herd of swine was feeding at some distance from them. The demons begged Jesus, if you cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And Jesus said to them, go. So they came out and entered the swine, and suddenly the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. The swine herds ran off, and on going into the town, they told the whole story about what had happened to the demoniacs. Then the whole town came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their neighborhood.
Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you today. As we begin this morning, I would like to take a moment to unburden myself from any responsibility of choosing this Sunday's text, (laughs) especially the week after Easter. As many of you know, I am going through the ordination process and consequently am retired or required, I wish I was retired, required to take a preaching course. Bob Kettering, who is familiar to most of you, is my instructor for the class, and he thought this would be a fun and challenging text for me to preach on. If we didn't know it before, it is clear now that Bob has a bit of a devilish streak in him. (laughs) To ask such a young, novice preacher such as me to draw and to preach on drowning pigs, which is what most people remember about this particular passage. However, after much research, study, and more than a little frustration, I'm hoping that after today, you will remember this passage with a bit more understanding and appreciation and perhaps maybe even experience a smidge of conviction. Because this text has so many intertwined parts, I think it is helpful to begin by providing some context. Matthew is primarily writing to a Jewish audience with the purpose of portraying Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah. That's an important point in understanding the meaning of today's text. Matthew records and presents Jesus' miracles to convince the reader of that reality. There are 31 miracles recorded in the Gospel, consisting of 18 healings of the blind, lame, deaf, mute, and other afflictions, seven wondrous miracles, calming of the water and the waves, feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, cursing a fig tree, four exorcisms, one passage reporting Jesus raising someone from the dead, and of course, his own resurrection, which we celebrated last week. The miracles are intended to show Jesus's authority over three distinct realms, the natural realm, the physical bodily realm, and the spiritual realm. This particular story is also reported in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Between the three, there is some disagreement about the specific place in which the story occurs, though the named places are similar, but not exact. The Gospels of Mark and Luke cite each location as a different but similar name than Matthew. Matthew calls the place the Gadarenes, But scholars agree that it is the same region, and that region is further accepted by most scholars to be in an area inhabited by Jews, not Gentiles. Why is that an important part? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because there are pigs, apparently lots of pigs, maybe up to 2,000 pigs being raised in this particular area. And what do we know about pigs and Jewish law. Pigs are no bueno. And yet, these particular Jews are peculiarly provocative, prodigious pig peddlers. So we can conclude that the Jews in this region are not necessarily keen on towing the line on religious practice and are even openly rebellious to God. Moving into the lesson, we find Jesus fresh off the boat from crossing the sea, just after performing the miracle of calming the storm, walking up the hill when he encounters the two demon-possessed men living amongst the tombs. Another interesting point to note is that these men are also understood to be Jewish, and Jewish law further forbids them from being around dead people in graveyards, or they are considered unclean. However, being demon-possessed, They are maybe not so much as rebellious as the pig farming Jews as to be considered unfortunate. But their condition of being in conflict with God is nonetheless the same as the communities. Matthew doesn't tell us specifically of the condition of the men, but Mark and Luke indicate that they were severely tormented, that they harmed themselves and they cried out day and night. So fierce are these men that it is reported that people cannot pass by safely, and the route is, for all practical purposes, blocked by the men. When the two possessed men see Jesus, 
the demons immediately recognize who he is and bow to his authority. This is an important detail to recall if we are keeping Matthew's intention for writing, proving Jesus' power and authority in focus. They ask if Jesus is coming to torment them before their time. This is also a detail that Matthew uses to point to Jesus' ultimate role as the savior and judge of the world. The demons, and now the reader, understand that Jesus will one day put right the spiritual realm and cast Satan and his followers into the abyss. The next part of the story, as it continues, was always a bit perplexing to me. The demons make a request of Jesus. If you cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And Jesus says, go. Now, why would Jesus grant the wish of the demons to go into the pigs and not just send them into the abyss where they are destined to go anyway? And why entertain them at all? Interestingly, the translation here has a bearing on our understanding. The translation from the original text to the modern word if, as when they say, if you are going to cast us out, is actually better understood as because. The demons knew he was going to cast them out. It wasn't a question or a choice, as if seems to imply. Jesus had every intention from the jump to cast out the demons and restore the men. That is his ultimate purpose, to bring healing and wholeness to the unfortunate and tortured men. Matthew again deviates from the other gospels in this story in that he doesn't state what happened to the men specifically after the demons were cast out. Mark and Luke both indicate that the men were later found by the townspeople to be dressed, sitting peacefully, having been restored to their right minds. Jesus was the ultimate multitasker. By casting out the demons, he demonstrated his authority and power over the physical and spiritual realm and his love, compassion, mercy, and desire to restore men to wholeness and well-being. As we'll see in a second, there are additional goals that he accomplished by allowing the demons to go into the pigs. There are four things that are directly related to the point mentioned earlier of the Jews living in open rebellion to God by farming pigs. First, Jesus is allowing the demons to go into the pigs and the pigs ultimately committing porcine suicide, removed the defiling animals from the area, thereby cleansing it and restoring it to appropriate Jewish, cultural, societal, and religious norms. Secondly, that many pigs would have represented a huge economic base for the community and would have likely provided them with a very substantial and good lifestyle. With the pigs destroyed, it is likely that these people would have sustained severe economic and social consequences. Jesus' removal of the pigs was a glimpse of the judgment that would befall them for their active, wanton, and open rebellion to God. Third, it would have also provided them the opportunity to turn to God for their own restoration and sustenance and return to right relationship with him. Lastly, by removing the demons from the men and putting them into the pigs, Jesus created a safe corridor for travel, decreasing the local demon-possessed individual and daily public traveler interactions. Turns out he was also the ultimate secretary of transportation. Thus far, The story pretty effectively communicates what Matthew intended, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior and Judge of the world. He has authority and power over the natural, physical, and spiritual realms. He is loving and kind, compassionate, and merciful. He is interested in removal of sin and restoration of humans and communities, and wants humanity to be in right relationship with him. This is the Jesus that Matthew wanted his contemporaries and you and I to believe in, to know, and rely on. Jesus desires relationship with us. His desire is to transform us and to make us whole. He is willing to bring our rebellion to task and remove that which harms us. He is sovereign. He has all authority and power here on earth and in heaven and is capable and trustworthy. 
He is loving and kind and merciful to us, even when we are not lovely, kind, or merciful ourselves. And he will one day set all creation, humanity, and the spiritual realm back to its originally intended idyllic state. However, the story doesn't end there. As Judy read for us in in verses 33 and 34, the swine herds ran off, and going into town, they told the whole story about what happened to the men possessed by demons. Then the whole town came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to come and stay with them, to forgive them, to heal them, to teach them, and they worshipped him. Well, I have to assume that that's the way the story was supposed to conclude, but it didn't. Instead, the townspeople came out and begged him to leave. I wonder, how is that possible? That despite all the tangible evidence as to who Jesus was, that they would reject him? Were there none in the town sick and in need of healing? Were there none in the town who needed deliverance from some type of addiction or spiritual oppression? Were there no weak and outcast in the need of the good news of his love? Were there no sinners in need of his forgiveness and saving grace? Or was it because he took away their pigs, their livelihood, their status, their comfort, their self-reliance, their self-centeredness, challenged their ideas of right and wrong, challenged their ideas of who was worthy and who was not? and made them consider their choices in relation to God. But really, there are so many examples in the Bible that present this exact same dynamic. In Matthew 12 and other gospel accounts, tell of Jesus and the Pharisees, who are direct eyewitnesses to Jesus' teaching, miracles, and love, and yet reject him and eventually have him killed because he called out their hypocrisy challenged their religious beliefs, and derided their love of social status. In Matthew 19, we read of the rich young ruler who did all the right religious things, but because of his great wealth, was unwilling to take the final step in truly following Jesus. The Jews in Jerusalem loved Jesus at the beginning of the Passover festival, and by the end of the week, called for his death because he was not the warrior king that they wanted. He was a servant king, more interested in saving their souls from sin and death than a military deliverance from Rome. They rejected Jesus because he called them to repentance, transformation, and restored relationship to God. Sadly, I have to confess that like the Jews in the story, I also have some pigs. Sometimes I reject Jesus, and for all the same reasons, I would be willing to bet that you have some pigs too. I'm sure our pigs are not as obvious as keeping a herd of them on a hillside in plain sight. No, we are good Christians. We keep them well hidden. We hide them in our hearts and minds, in the privacy of our homes, offices, in places we visit. But occasionally, one of our pigs may slip out of its private pen and run down the middle of the street for everyone to see. We become self-serving and exercise power and control tactics over others in order to get our way. We become rigid in our theology and we stop listening and loving like Jesus. We hold on to a pervasive sin that really isn't that bad. We hold on to our resources and don't give out of our abundance, fearful of the economy and what the future might hold. We hold tightly to our rules, roles, and expectations of how others should behave and don't give grace when they don't behave as they should. We objectify and demean others and treat them as less than. We hide our phones from our spouses so they can't see our browsing history 
or text conversations. We fill our calendars and activities so that they don't allow us to attend church regularly. We schedule our time so completely that there is not time to be alone with God. We avoid conflict in order to keep the peace and yet build resentments in our hearts. Our pigs are just as numerous, if not as obvious. And even when I've identified a pig in my life and finally kick it out of the house, I turn around and there are three more pigs. They continue to show up even when I thought I had hidden them well away from others, from myself and even God. Stupid pigs. The problem really isn't the pigs though, is it? The problem is what Jesus pointed out in Matthew 5, 28, when Jesus said, but I say unto you that whosoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The problem is a matter of the heart, our attention, our intention, and our focus. And for that, the only sure remedy is our willingness to change and Jesus' transformative power that he demonstrated in our story today. Matthew has shown us that Jesus has authority and power over the heavens and the earth. And while Jesus' miracles demonstrated his authority and power, they also showed how much he loved us and how much he came to serve and to restore people's lives. Jesus wants relationship with humanity, but he does not exercise authority over free will. He wants relationship with people, not robots. Jesus wants to transform our lives and save us from judgment. Transformation and relationship with God are the things we have to intentionally choose and prioritize every day. There is an illustration that I use from time to time with my clients that I would like to share that I hope will be helpful to our understanding of the development of relationship, trust, and the transformative process with Jesus. When we first become acquainted with a new person, we may choose to begin a relationship with them. We meet them outside our home at some public gathering place. And as the relationship develops and a trust bond is formed, we may invite them to our home. This is the invitation of relational intimacy, where we allow someone to come and see where we live, how we live, and the things that we value. On the initial visit, we clean the house thoroughly in order to make a good first impression and likely allow that person or persons access to the living room and perhaps the guest bathroom. Assuming the relationship progresses, we may invite them over for dinner and grant them greater access to our home, the living room, the kitchen, and the dining room. We might allow them to see some dirty dishes in the sink or the state of disorganization of our refrigerator as we open and close it for a decanter of water. Certainly not wine. We are brethren, after all. As trust and intimacy build, we may invite them over to watch a Sunday football game, and they are granted access to our real living space, complete with a half-empty can of soda on the end table, some shoes on the floor, the undusted TV, and some pretzel pieces between the couch cushions. At this point in the relationship, we may forego the formalities of knocking on the door and allowing unfettered access to our home and allowing them to get their own snacks and drinks. But there are still limits. The bedroom. That is only for the closest, most intimate of relationships. Few people get access to the bedroom, master bath, and the closets. Those are the most private areas we reserve for ourselves. In that place, the bed sometimes doesn't get made. Underwear might be left lying on the floor. Private reading materials left on the bedside table. Laundry piled in the corner. Toothpaste might remain in the sink. In the toilet, perhaps unflushed. This is the raw, unfiltered us that we show few people. And what we hide in our bedroom closets is the most personal and private of all. Our transformative journey with Jesus progresses in the same way. When we first meet him, we are glad to know him, but it might keep him at arm's length. 
And as we grow to know him, we begin to trust him and allow him greater access to see more of our true selves. Jesus, though, doesn't want to be limited to the living room. He wants to enter and clean the entire house, even the bedroom closet. He wants to rid us of all that is in the house that harms us and keeps us from living the best life that we can. He invites us to a total deep cleaning. To experience that, we have to grant him total access and to be open to him drowning our pigs and not just the big ones, not just the obvious ones in the front yard and the ones we keep hidden on the top shelf of the bedroom closet way in the back where nobody is allowed to look so that we can become more holy, have our minds restored and be in right relationship with God. Will we embrace Jesus and what he can do for us or will we fear and reject him as the townspeople in the story did or only allow him limited access Will we choose to put our faith and trust in God and his purpose and plans for our lives or ask him to leave us as we are, unchanged or only partially transformed according to our comfort level and limited commitment? Can he come into the bedroom and see the true state of our lives or just stand in the foyer where we keep everything nice and tidy? If we allow Jesus unfettered access to transform our lives, we can have abundant life, contentment and joy and assurance of eternal life with God. If we reject Jesus or only allow him limited access, we deny ourselves all the best that he has for us. Like the demon possessed men, we open ourselves up to being tormented, harming ourselves and others by thoughts, attitudes and behaviors and left crying out in pain. Will we sacrifice the best we can truly have for mediocrity or worse in this life just to keep our pigs? I hope that you and I will consider opening up ourselves and our lives entirely to Jesus. Is that easy? No. Will we ever drown all of our pigs? No. But Jesus understands that. And there is forgiveness and sufficient grace for that reality. But by not choosing to allow Jesus to begin, continue, and complete his personal restorative work within us, we risk paying a very high price for pork. Amen.
My friends, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Jesus has the desire, the power, and the authority to remove anything that keeps you from having abundant life, peace, contentment, and joy. He loves you, has compassion for you, will forgive you and restore your soul. I encourage you then to open your lives fully to his transformative power and let him who began the good work within you to continue that work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Go in peace.